Uh, bless the Lord. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Um, we're going to do some things. We're going to do a few songs that uh, they're throwback. They're not just throwback. You guys are going to be throwback for us. We haven't we haven't had a lot of time with them, but you would just ask you for Paul asked last week for um, to to show him some. Uh, Lord, just give him some uh, grace. I just asked for a double portion for us this morning, please. And uh, I was just thinking about something I just want to share before. <clears throat> how science and God work together. And science actually points to God if you want to see Him. And uh, we, we live on planet Earth. And around the circumference of the Earth is about 24,000 miles plus a little bit. And to go from point A to point A again, facing in any particular direction, takes 24 hours. So therefore, we're spinning at the equator 1,000 miles an hour. And I don't feel a thing. We're pretty close to it. Now, if you're at the North Pole or the South Pole, you're hardly spinning at all. Same thing. You know, it's a little colder there. But um, also, at the same time, the Earth is going in an orbit around the uh, Sun. And from point A to point A again, that's 365 days. And it's traveling at a speed of 66,600 miles plus a little bit. So... If you don't have, if science uh, doesn't point you to faith at some point, it will. Science proves God. Anyway, we can start and all the help we can get. My voice is gone. All right. <coughs> And when your eyes are on this 
an effort to stand up here. Thank you. So I'm going to ask you if you just if you know the songs, and even if you don't know the songs, it's really easy. Just these next two songs, if you could help us sing them. They're throwbacks from probably a lot of you when you got saved. They were popular.
Hold on, that's it. That's it, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Paul. <laughs> All right, there you go. Why should this week be any different, right? <laughs> oh, man. All right. Hey, thank you, Larry. And the boys. Uh, yeah, that was some, some great worship music. And uh, appreciate you guys filling in. Um, Dave's been uh, taking a vacation, actually. Uh, I think a lot of you guys are aware of it, but those of you who, who aren't, Dave, the guitar player for the Posse Band, um, he uh, is, is kind of like on a once-in-a-lifetime motorcycle trip with his son. And uh, they, they're over, um, they, they went through Yellowstone, and now they're kind of coming down through California and uh, just spending some quality time together. And uh, so that's where Dave's been. And uh, uh, he's been checking in with us, and we've been calling him in the morning to uh, make sure we're doing things right here. Um, <laughs> Uh, but anyways, he is, uh, he should be back next Sunday, so we'll have the, the full posse band will be back. Um, but I'm so appreciative that uh, God has given us some other talent here that can come in and, and fill in, so. Uh, thank you, there. All right, well, welcome to Happy Hour at the World Famous Salvation Saloon. And uh, for those of you who just may be here for the very first time, and I know there's a few of you out there, uh, first thing we want to do in this service is just let you guys know that we are so glad you guys are here. And we truly believe God is going to bless you guys today. Uh, there is one thing we would ask of you, though, if you don't mind, and that is if you just grab one of these little yellow cards that you see all over the place. And if you would, just throw your name in that, tell us where you're from, that'd be cool. And then if you don't mind, if you just hold on to this card till the end of the service and right in the uh, bottom in the comment section. Uh, tell us what you thought. We're always kind of curious. So if you do that, that would be great. Uh, you can then take this card and on your way out, uh, there'll be a, a bucket by the door and you just drop that card in that uh, bucket. Uh, but again, we are so glad you guys are here. From here on out, you are our guest. So sit back, hang on, and enjoy the ride. Uh, everyone else knows we do have some other purposes for this card though, and that is if there happens to be a birthday or an anniversary or could be just about anything that you think we got to know about, well you can throw it in this card uh, one week in advance. But the main reason we have these cards is for prayer. So if you're here and you have a need in your life, uh, put your need down on this card and give God an opportunity to show himself strong because prayer does work. Amen people? Amen. Bible tells us this. Bible tells us that our God is a present help in times of trouble. It uh, also tells us that sometimes we have not because we ask not. So uh, put your needs down on this card. All right. Well, here at the Salvation Saloon, we are a family. And like every family, we try to make sure we always recognize each other. And uh, by glory, I think we got a whole mess of salonistic birthdays. Look at this. <laughs> Now, if you uh, do happen to be here for the very first time, just so you do know, we do call our congregation members salonatics. And so every week what we do is we'll uh, get a picture, usually an old picture, we throw it out. Sometimes, like last week, we tweak it a little and have a little bit of fun. Uh, but here's one we just uh, got in, and I, uh, uh, I know we're going to uh, fool you guys uh, this week. Uh, maybe not Nancy Horry, but I, I, uh, I know the rest of you. But let's see, prove me wrong. So tell me if you can uh, guess who this lunatic is. Boss 
Russell Andrews? George Merrill. George Merrill? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, nothing else? Well, let's find out. Well, the real Saluna please stand up. Where is he? It's Mike Horry. <laughs> That's why I said we probably wouldn't fool Nancy Horry. <laughs> All right. Well, we do have, uh, moving right along here, we do have a regular list of weekly activities in which you guys are all welcome to join in and be a part. Uh, Everything is going on there with the exception of men's Bible study. Uh, Thursday, don't forget men's fellowship breakfast. Uh, and that's in beautiful downtown Doonton, Florida. Uh, that's uh, at the Our Place uh, restaurant, and then Thursday night the women have their uh, Bible study going on. Uh, and the only thing I really have to pass on is that um, uh, real important for those of you who are uh, going on the Bronson Project, uh, we do have a meeting after the service, so if you're going on, on the Bronson Project, uh, we need to have you there for that. I think you guys already know. So. Uh, just a reminder, uh, but that's it. So let's get uh, uh, Miles Bill up here, and he will pray God's blessing on the remainder of the service, and then we'll get to God's word. <laughs> Because that is how far, you know, our sin has been separated, you know, from us. As far as the east is from the west, because of the sacrifice Jesus Christ made for us. Amen. Amen. Because if you start on the equator and you start traveling east, no matter how far you travel, you will always be traveling east. If you start out on the equator and you start heading west, you will also always, always, always be traveling west. However, north and south is different. Because if you are traveling north, once you hit the top of the world and you pass that point, you're no longer traveling north, you're actually traveling south. So that is the wisdom of God's Word. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> wisdom and truth, faith, hope, and love. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. All right. Hey, who's here for the first time today, by the way? Yeah. How you doing? Yeah, right, yeah you're being dimed out. People are pointing at you. <laughs> Good morning. How are you? Hi, everybody. Thank you all so much for coming. We know, uh, we know that you're going to be blessed today. We're blessed to have you here. This is now, though, back to business, the time where we take up uh, our offering. So if y'all would, please prepare for that offering. And if you're going to be making out a check, please make that check out to the Salvation Saloon. And we do, in fact, accept electronic payments next door at the saloon. So let me take you back to God's Word, to the book of Malachi. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, 
that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you, and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. That's the one time where God actually challenges us, puts us to the test, and says, try me. Try me. And I know that it's a common misconception that, well, we can't afford to give. Well, to be perfectly honest, God challenges you right here in the book of Malachi and says, you know what, you can. And, you, and if you do, I will bless that. I will bless that giving. I will bless that. And you will be blessed. So I challenge everyone, think about that. And put God to the test. If he won't open up for the doors of heaven for you and pour down blessings until there's no more need. Amen. So if y'all would, please join me in prayer, everybody. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this blessing. Thank you so much for this ministry. And thank you for all of my brothers and sisters here and all of those that are within the sound of my voice. And I just pray that your Holy Spirit fills this room and fills the heart of every person that hears these words, Lord. That I lift up my brothers and sisters to you. I lift up this broken world to you. And I pray your mercy and your grace and your forgiveness and thankful that it is already done by the work of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So thank you, Lord, and bless us as we leave here today and uh, so that we can minister for you and be examples for you and be blessed in everything we do in your mighty name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. I love you. We love you, Bill.
well-oiled machine. <laughs> Guys, ready for some good stuff? Yes. yes. All right. I think I, I think I'm going to provide that uh, today from God's uh, Word. Uh, but first, let's uh, let's start with a little review. And, and last time, it was last time that we uh, started uh, chapter three in the book of uh, Philippians, uh, and, and uh, it began with Paul um, encouraging us right to uh, rejoice in the Lord. Uh, because as it says in Nehemiah, right, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And that joy is our strength because despite the things that we go through and, and face in life, the Lord is always there, right? He's always there, as it uh, says in Psalms uh, 46.1, right? He's, he's always there to be our refuge and strength and a present help in times of trouble. And uh, I thought I'd just throw in a couple other verses that confirms his presence in our lives and uh, encourages that joy, uh, such as Deuteronomy 31, 6, uh, which says this, it says, Be strong and courageous and fear not, because the Lord your God goes with you wherever you go and will never leave your side. Uh, and then there's Isaiah 54, 17, that tells us that no weapon formed against us will prosper. And, and so it's our faith, right, in those promises in God's Word that allows us to look beyond our circumstances. Amen? Amen. And uh, uh, so Paul uh, kind of uh, began by, uh, again, uh, uh, encouraging us to, uh, uh, to have joy. Uh, and then from there, he, he went on to uh, warn us, uh, again, about those who attempt to enslave us uh, back into the bondage of the law, uh, back into like a, a works-based salvation, okay, which is contrary to the law of grace. And uh, Paul then uh, used himself, though, as an example, uh, because nobody was more uh, dedicated to the law than that he once was, right? And we had talked about that, uh, actually gave us a little resume uh, to, uh, to support that. Um, but here's the thing, when Paul came face to face with that grace on the road uh, to Damascus, well, it was then that he came to the realization that all his previous efforts to gain his own righteousness, well, they were counted as loss, right? Counted as loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, his Lord, right? The, the Lord whose righteousness was imputed to him, right, and to all men on the basis of our faith in him alone. And, man, you want to talk about joy? Well, that certainly takes a lot of pressure off us, doesn't it? Right? It takes a lot of pressure off, off us when we finally realize that it's not about what we can do for Christ, but it's all about what Christ has done for us. Amen, people? Amen. And so when uh, Paul gained uh, the surpassing worth of all that, um, then uh, what other conclusion could he come to other than what he now says in verse 10? And that is this. Paul says, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. Um, now here's the thing. That word know in the Greek, okay, is not talking about, uh, about an intellectual knowledge. Not talking about knowing about Jesus, right? But it's talking about knowledge that comes from personal experience, right? And, and that's the same when he then says, I want to know the power of his resurrection. Well, he wants to experience that as well. Right, it experience its, its power to save, right, and its power to sustain that salvation. And, and then he even uh, says he, he wants to know participation in his sufferings. Now, that may sound a little like a, a kind of a strange desire, but Paul knows that that is where the rubber meets the road. Right? And, and it meets the road when through those tough times our devotion and trust is still there. Right? And, and, and then there's a lot of other positives that actually also come out of those tough times. Because that's where we also develop the empathy 
to relate to others in their times of, of struggle. Amen? And, and uh, it's by exercising our faith in those times of struggle, right, that, uh, uh, that our faith also becomes stronger. Right? Just as the, the saying goes, right? We all, we've all heard this, right? No pain, no gain. No pain, no gain. Right? Because just uh, as a muscle needs to be worked to get stronger, well, so do our spiritual uh, muscles. Right? They need to be worked to get stronger. And, and then uh, that participation in this suffering is uh, followed by this desire and that uh, that's to become like him in his death. Paul says he wants to become like Jesus in his death. Now, some have taken this to mean um, that, that like Jesus, Paul would, would like to die a martyr's death. Um, but I don't think he's referring to the method of his death here, um, but I think he's uh, referring to the, uh, the transformation of our bodies after death. Right? Because as John said, John said it's on that day, that day of our resurrection, that we will then be like him. And, and we see that's uh, actually what he's referring to when we now go to verse 11. Because there, as he elaborates on, on being like Jesus in his death, well, he then goes on to say this, and, and that is he hopes to somehow attain that resurrection from the dead. He hopes to somehow attain that resurrection from the dead. And uh, and Paul will actually even confirm this more a little later, uh, confirm his hope to attain that incorruptible, uh, resurrected body. Uh, when in actually, I think it's the last verse of this chapter, uh, he's going to close by saying uh, that he eagerly awaits that day when his lowly body will be transformed into the likeness of his glorious body. Um, but to kind of put all of this together here, uh, what Paul is saying is that uh, he wants to know Jesus so completely, right? And he wants to be so identified with him, right, through his power and even through his suffering so that through that, that intimate and personal relationship with his Lord, uh, his resurrection would be, would be attained. And, and so that's kind of uh, everything together, kind, kind of uh, a summary of, of what he's saying here. Uh, which in verse... Uh, 12, uh, he then adds this, and, and that is, uh, I mean, talking about um, the benefits of his resurrection, he then says, not that I have already obtained all this. And, and I think we know that's obvious, because he can't obtain right, the benefits of the resurrection until he dies, and, and Paul's not dead yet. And so since that's the case, well, he also adds this, he says, nor have I already arrived at my goal which uh, means that he knows there is still more for him to accomplish for the cause of Christ. And so since for Paul, right, remember, he said to live as Christ, and so since for him to live as Christ, then while he's still here, then this is what he says. He says, I press on. I press on, right, to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. All right, that's Paul's focus. Right? And that should be our focus as well. Right? Because as it as said in Ephesians uh, 2.10, I've been getting a lot of mileage out of this verse, but uh, Ephesians 2.10, it tells us this. It says that we are uh, all God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Right? Good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So uh, as it's put in some other uh, Bible translations, we need to press on to apprehend what we've been apprehended for. Right? We need to press on to apprehend what we've been apprehended for. And in verse 13, as far as that apprehension goes, well, Paul, uh, well again, Paul uh, says, uh, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. And, and then he follows uh, that with this. And, um, man, this is something that I think is just so, uh, one of my favorite verses in, in the whole Bible. Um, I think it's just so profound and wise. And, and that is this. Paul then says, uh, says, but the one thing I do, the one thing I do is to forget what is behind and strain towards what is ahead. 
Preach it. One thing I do is to forget what is behind and strain towards what is ahead. Well, here's the thing. In life, we've all been through some hard times. Right? And in some of those hard times, I mean, we've all been treated badly and we've been treated unfairly. And, and yeah, I mean, that is always unfortunate, but it happens. But if at that point we then allow it, man, it is really easy for us to start feeling sorry for ourselves. Right? And sometimes we can get so bummed out that, that we make a bet in all that self-pity. Right? And the more we feed that pity, the bigger it gets. Right? The bigger it gets. And sometimes it grows so big that we just cannot get by it. And what does that result in? Well, it results in, in, in keeping us from moving on. Amen? That is going to keep us from moving on. All right. This is Paul the Apostle, right? Well, no one was more victimized than old Paul. Right? Because we know that, you know, this guy had, had faced constant opposition. Right? Including uh, being uh, beaten and thrown in jail like numerous times. And we know that as he's actually writing this letter here, well, we know he's in jail. He's in a Roman, a Roman prison. But yet, despite his right to uh, feel legitimately victimized, well, I think this is awesome here because more importantly, you know, this is what he realized. He, what he realizes is that, that, that he has a need to apprehend what he had been apprehended for. Amen? No one was more uh, had more right to feel victimized, but yet he didn't concentrate it on. Didn't concentrate on that. Right? His goal was to apprehend what he had been apprehended for, and that's why he, he said, "Right, the one thing I do is to forget those things which are behind." Right? Because he knows, man, the past is the past. And as much as he or any of us might want to, there is nothing that we can do to change that past. Right? And, and knowing that is why Paul then said, I reach forward to those things before me. Because maybe we can't do anything about our yesterdays, but we all have something to say about our tomorrows. Amen? Amen. And so just as the Bible says, right, knowing the schemes of the enemy, right, knowing that all this opposition is the enemy's attempts, uh, attempt to, to place Paul's focus on his circumstances and not on his calling, well, because of that, Paul knows his only option is this in verse 14, and that is, he, as he says, I press on. Again, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So, as the saying goes, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Amen? When the going gets tough, the tough get going. And, and I was thinking about this this week, and um, by example, um, I, I was kind of looking at marathon runners, right? Because one thing that, that they, for anyone here ever run a marathon? No? Okay, I was going to tell him to raise a hand. I said, you're nuts, man. 26 miles a long way, right? When you're hoping it. So. Um, but one thing that they've found is, is that at a certain uh, mile mark, there's this a term they use for something that's very likely to happen, and that is called hitting the wall, right? Hitting the wall. There, there's a neat little uh, slide. Um, and, and hitting the wall is uh, running into this feeling of complete exhaustion. And, and it's so strong that, that it's like you just can't go on, right? But what is it that they learn to do when, when they hit this wall? Well, I'll tell you this, it's not to give up and quit, but it's to continue to press on to continue to press on, right? Because as they do, this is what they've also found. They found that that is when the runner will actually uh, suddenly get their second wind. Ever hear of that? Uh, they'll get their second wind. And if you have ever experienced that, I mean, that is a feeling like, uh, like you can just go on forever. 
You could just go on forever. And, and so likewise, we have to follow that same rule, right? That same rule and mindset uh, of just pressing on, pressing on. And uh, confirming that in verse 15, uh, we find Paul saying that uh, all of us then, who are mature, should take such a view of things. Should take such a view of things. And so, to those of us who've kind of been around the block and uh, or been around the block enough to know those, those schemes of the enemy, well, the only option is to press on. Right? The only option is to just press on and just keep fighting that good fight of faith. Uh, but then Paul uh, adds, adds this, he adds that if, if, uh, if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. And so as it says in, in Proverbs 3, 6, right, acknowledge the Lord in all your ways and he will direct you. He will direct you. Uh, but also to that in verse 16, uh, Paul then says this, he says, only let us live up to what we have already attained. Now this is kind of confusing here because Paul really doesn't specify what he uh, meant by thinking differently. Um, but still, what he does is he still encourages them to continue to press on. Right? Continue to press on with what's led them to the progress that they have already attained. Right? So don't stop. Don't be dormant. Press on. Press on. Right? But... If there's any uh, confusion uh, to what will lead to progress, and well, Paul has this to say in verse 17, and that is, uh, he says to, uh, tells them to just join together in following my example. Follow my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. All right. Want to know what pressing on looks like? Well, all you need to do is just look at the life of, of this guy here. Look at the life of the, the Apostle Paul. Uh, but then there's also, uh, obviously, some bad examples out there, too. And so in verse 18, he says this, For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears. I mean, that's, so this is how important this is. Even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. And to uh, describe those enemies in verse 19, Paul says this. He says their destiny is destruction. He says their God is their stomach. Okay, which is to say their God is, is their fleshly appetites. Right? And then uh, he also adds this. He says their glory is in their shame. As their mind is set on earthly things. So... Right there, that, that is the contrast, right, between those who press on and live for Christ and those who press on and live for themselves. Now, we all know there's all kinds of physical uh, pleasures in this world. Um, but I, I want to make it clear that Paul's not necessarily saying that it is never okay for us to experience those pleasures. Right, because it is a blessing to sit down and eat a good New York style pizza. Amen? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Billy's digging it back there. Yeah. How about this one, Bill? It's also a blessing, right, to, um, to, to eat like a whole box of fresh out of the oven Krispy Kremes, right? <laughs> have you guys ever been to those? The, I don't know if they have one around here anymore. I don't think they do. But you used to go in and you used to get them right out of the oven and they just melt in your mouth. Oh my gosh, right? I, I mean, it was something else. It's also a blessing, right? You get on that Harley Davidson and go for a ride, right? Especially when you go for a ride right out in the country or out, you know, out uh, through the mountains. Um, because while you're out there, I mean, you see God, right? You see God's beautiful creation. Right? That is a blessing. And, right, it's a blessing to share the intimacy that is ours through marriage. Right? Because God created us to be able to enjoy and experience those physical pleasures. But here's the thing. And that is, he did not create those pleasures to be our God though. Amen? Those pleasures are not there to be our God. And, and so that is where we need to draw the line. Right? Because our commitment and loyalty needs to fall on, on our God. Right? And, and that means 
basically this. That means we cannot have dual citizenship. Because I'll tell you what, it don't work. It doesn't work. And it doesn't work because either we'll have too much of the world to be happy in Christ or too much of Christ to be happy in the world. And, and so as believers, right, believers who are in this world but not of this world, well, we can't forget this in verse 20. And that is our citizenship. It's still in heaven, people. We may be in this world, but we're not of this world. Right? Our citizenship is still in heaven. And we are just here on this earth to apprehend what God has apprehended us to do. Amen? That's why we're here. And if our minds are focused on that, focus on that prize that, that lies ahead, then as Paul continues, uh, we will eagerly uh, uh, await our Savior from there, our Savior from heaven. And who is that Savior from heaven? Well, it is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, who in verse 21, uh, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, and, and here it is right here, uh, he will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And that's the prize. That's the prize. Amen? Amen. Right? That's the surpassing worth that is ours by knowing and, and having that personal relationship with Christ Jesus our Lord. Right? And all that other stuff. Right? All the, uh, the temporary riches and, and accomplishments, right? all the, uh, the accolades and, and fames that we may attain in this world, well, in comparison to the Lord, as, as Paul stated, they can all be counted as, as loss. Right? And in fact, Paul said they, they can all be counted as being literally garbage. Garbage. Right? Because when we leave this life, we ain't taking that stuff with us. We're leaving it behind. Because there is one life to live, and it will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. And that is the point that Paul has been trying to make here in chapter 3. Amen? Yeah. All right, good stuff. All right, come on up, Billy. I'm going to have you take it from here. Um, yeah, man, I just think it's so powerful, you know? Um, Word of God is just so incredible, and I, I think this is just a, uh, an exceptional um, example of that. You know, I have the whole book of Philippians is, is just so powerful. Um, but again, this is what we know. We know that, um, you know, we can read this stuff, and we can hear this stuff, and, and we can accept it, um, but it doesn't do us any good unless we apply it. Amen, people? Amen. All right, so you've got something to think about this week. Pastor Paul, I mean, who else can make you laugh, right? <laughs> marathon. He wanted to know if anybody ran a marathon. Have you seen these people? <laughs> oh my gosh. Hitting the wall. I've hit a few walls, but that's because I was not hitting the second wind. I was five sheets to the wind. <laughs> totally different kind of thing. You know, when you really hit that second wall, what you do like we do in New York is you jump in the subway and you get to the end, and then you just run through and say, yeah, I went. <laughs> I mean, that's what you know, foreigners do. <laughs> you know, earlier when, uh, well, I'll, I'll just tell you this. There's really nothing exciting today. It's National Bittersweet Chocolate Day. Yeah. But yeah. yesterday was dressed like a dork day. Mm. And I'm seeing some of you are celebrating. <laughs> Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Before we started this morning in that worship song, we got to that I exalt thee and I exalt thee. And there's some times in my life where I just realize that I can feel God right here in my chest. And I had one of those moments and I just started weeping in the back. And I'm like, God, 
No one will notice. Everybody noticed. They're all running up to me. You okay? You okay? I'm like, I'm good. I'm good. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. That's grateful. Amen. Right? Because sometimes it's overwhelming to think that a holy God would want anything to do with the likes of us. And sometimes it just brings you to tears and gratitude. And it just overwhelms me. So that's what that was about. So I love when we get to do those kind of songs and we just focus on who God really is. And of course, once we do that, then we realize who we really are. That's the unfun part of that. Yeah. Right? Because God calls us to sanctify ourselves to Him. Now that we know Him and we know what holiness is about, He calls us to try to attain that in our lives. And one of the great things that God does for us is He puts people in our lives that sometimes annoy the crap out of us. <laughs> Have any of those? Those are what we call sandpaper. They're there to just irritate and rub against and irritate and rub against until that thing that's in you gets dealt with. So if there's someone in your life that's doing that, that just totally annoys you every time you look at them, you go, ah! There's something about them that you don't like in you. So if you don't have someone like that in your life, hang out with me, right? <laughs> and also, if you don't have someone like that in your life, then you are that for someone else. I promise. <laughs> it's like I love to say, I don't get resentments anymore. I give them, right? So the thing with all of this, though, is that we know who God is, right? Those of us that have accepted him, that have trusted him for our salvation, that are counting on what Paul talked about this morning. The fact that one day, all of this means nothing. In the blink of an eye, whether Jesus comes now or we die, in the snap of a finger, we're going to be standing in front of him. However it happens. There's only going to be one or two ways. He comes or we go. And we're going to have to answer for how we lived, how we treated people. What we did with the salvation he offered us. We win. This world is rough. There's crazy things that happen. There's stuff that gets thrown at us. We're surrounded by annoying people. But we win in the end because we've read the book and we know how it ends. The work of the cross is the finished work of the cross. We win. But we only win if we hold on and we only win if we've accepted that relationship and that gift. That's where it starts. And every one of us, whether we like it or not, is going to end up naked, on a table, getting dressed by strangers and put in a box. Every one of us. At some point. It might be this afternoon. It might not be for 40 years. But what we do with the gift that God offered us is determines where we go after that. So if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you better do it now. Say this prayer with me. Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner, but I believe in you. So from this point on, I want to rely on you. So I accept your love by accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior. So please forgive me and make all things new. And by the power of your grace, I will live my life for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope somebody out there said that prayer today and they meant it. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we just thank you once again for this place you provided for us to meet. We thank you that we live in a country where we can gather in your name freely. We ask, Lord, that you continue to bless those, bless the leadership, Lord, in Washington, to help them get their act together, God. Let them do what's honorable to you and what's best for your people. Lord, bless us, keep us safe, give us boldness this week to tell somebody about your great love for us and for them. We thank you and we love you and we thank you for every good thing. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.